Now, um, today we're going to be talking about the theory of evolution according to one of its more famous arguments. And uh, it's called the argument of an infinite number of monkeys. Sounds a little odd, but uh, bear with me. Back in 1913, a French mathematician wrote an article in which he claimed that the laws of statistics remain the same no matter what. And he invented an argument for his theory. He said that if you gave a million typewriters to a million monkeys and let them type randomly for 10 hours a day, no matter how much time goes by, they still could not produce the equivalent of the world's richest libraries. Uh, you know, I think he got a point there, you know? I don't think the monkeys could do it. Now, uh, there are some folks, I'm sure, amongst us, maybe the, some of the teens who don't know what a typewriter is. Yeah. So for your um, edification, I have a picture of one. Put that up, would you please? This, ladies and gentlemen, is a typewriter. And this is only one type of typewriter. There's many different types of typewriter, and they started in the uh, late 1800s, and uh, they finally uh, ended up with what you see there, and it has the famous QWERTY, QWERTY keyboard, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, and the reason that they, they did the letters the way they did was so that it would slow down some of the typists. The typists were getting so fast that the keys were getting jammed. You know, a little arm with a key goes up, whack, and makes uh, an impression through a, an inked ribbon onto a piece of paper, like that one there. So anyhow, for those um, who uh, may be wondering, what is a typewriter? Now you know, okay? Isn't that worth coming to church for? <laughs> About 20 years after the mathematician came up with his argument, uh, in the 1930s, the Darwinian evolutionists got a hold of the million monkey idea and they changed it to suit themselves in order to prove why Darwinian evolution is correct. Now, I will explain Darwinian evolution. They do not believe that God created the world, but they claim that all species of organisms arise and develop through the natural selection, that means random selection, of small inherited variations that increase the individual's ability to compete, survive, and reproduce. That, is, in a nutshell, is Darwinian evolution, started by a guy named Darwin. And so, to promote Darwinian evolution, the evolutionists started saying this, that if you were to give an infinite number of monkeys, an infinite number of typewriters, these things, and let them bang away randomly at the keys, that eventually one of them would produce the complete works of William Shakespeare. Now we have a picture of a monkey working away. There you go. There's two of them actually. I think this one is learning. And uh, this one is trying to change the ribbon, I think. But he's got something uh, typed out there. We're not quite sure what he's got. Uh, this is a famous argument. Uh, and I'll show it to you again. Do you have that slide with the quote? Pull it up. I sent it to you. It'll be there somewhere, I, I think. Anyhow, if it's not, let me know. But uh, in 2001, 17 years ago, researchers Hoffman and Hoffman borrowed the infinite monkey argument and used it to talk about the internet. You know, the evolutionists use the argument, the infinite monkey, infinite typewriter, to prove evolution. So Hoffman and Hoffman borrowed it to talk about the internet, saying the internet is so huge and so complex and growing that just like evolution, the internet will have a tendency to accidentally produce excellence. That's what they're saying. Did you find that quote? All right, good. Put it up, fire when ready. There we go. So here is the quote here. If you were to give an infinite number of monkeys, an infinite number of typewriters, one of them, would type out the complete works of William Shakespeare. Who's William Shakespeare? Well, there's his picture right there. He lived from the 1600s, 1500s to the 1600s, as you can see. And we're going to talk a little bit more about him. All right. Now, because of uh, Darwinian evolutionism, 
the infinite monkey argument has become one of their more powerful lines of reasoning. And basically they're saying that if given enough time, and to them it means billions of years, given enough time, the universe will form itself and evolve itself into the plant and animal, mineral and, king and people world that you see around you today, that we have today. Now I ask you, what do you think about the infinite monkey argument? Does it make logical sense that if you gave an infinite number of monkeys, an infinite number of typewriters, that eventually one of them would produce the complete works of William Shakespeare? Does that sound reasonable? Because um, to a lot of people it does. The argument sounds reasonable, and they say, after all, if you give enough time and talents and treasures, something's got to happen. If this argument is true, that you give an infinite number of monkeys, an infinite number of typewriters, and eventually one of them will produce the complete works of William Shakespeare, if that's true, then so is evolution. And yet, if we were to take some time, which we're going to do, and ask two, count them, two logical questions, we will come up with a lot of unanswered embarrassing problems for the evolutionists and they have no other answer except to say well we don't know and so let's bow for prayer and let's ask God to help us to see through things and establish our faith in his word our heavenly father we pause now before the almighty and uh, we, we have no trouble Lord in believing you created this world and this universe and everything else that there is and we give you honor and glory for that. And yet, Lord, we're faced with, with some very convincing sounding arguments. <clears throat> Our Father, we know that there's so many young people who have a faith in you and creation before they go off to worldly universities, colleges, and institutes of learning. And then after a year, their faith is shaken. And after three or four years, it's broken. Lord, we pray desperately for our young people, those in and going through uh, higher education, and we pray for their faith to remain firm and firmer still. We desperately need God's people to take a stand in this ungodly world. And so help us today as we examine this subject in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'd like just to encourage you to try to follow this as closely as you can. Uh, don't give in to the temptation to let your mind wander outside and think about what you're going to do for lunch and things. Keep your mind harnessed. Keep it here with us together. Try, try to follow this as closely as you can and maybe even take a couple of notes. But I'm going to ask two main questions. Here's the first main question. All right. Where did the monkeys come from? Now, the, the evolutionists have given us a, a kind of an irrefutable argument that if you give an infinite number of monkeys, an infinite number of typewriters, then one of them will produce the complete works, works of William Shakespeare. And if you're not sure what the complete works of William Shakespeare is, don't worry, we'll answer that for you as we go along. So that's the argument they've thrown at us. What are we going to do with it? Well, we're going to start by asking a question. Where did the monkeys come from? In order to do this, you have to... You have to have the monkeys, right? That's, without the monkeys, you've got no argument. Is that right? So where did the monkeys come from? And uh, what we'd like to know is, uh, did they all start from one monkey? How and where did that monkey come from? Let alone the infinite number. Did that one monkey evolve? If the one monkey evolved, what did it evolve from? But if the monkey did evolve, then doesn't that already prove evolution? And you don't even need this argument? If you've got an infinite number of monkeys that just evolved, huh? then case closed, isn't it? We don't need to go any further. The infinite number of monkey argument, uh, it stops right there. But that's not really much of an argument. That's like saying, well, believe this because I'm telling you to believe it. That's what it's like. And you're not allowed to question it. By the way, if you, if you ever go to a, 
a religious meeting, group, church, whatever, and you're not allowed to ask questions. Now, maybe not during the preaching, okay? All right, I think we all understand that. But I mean, afterward, if you've got a question on something, you know, feel free. Uh, that, that, that's what it's there for. You know, if you want to ask questions about the sermon, be my guest. You know, the sermon is not the, the, holy, the holy grail that you're not allowed to uh, question anything about. The cults don't want you to question it. A lot of Catholics have come to Christ because their priest kicked them out or told them, do not question. And of course, when you tell a kid not to do something, it's the first thing you want to do. So they start asking more questions and out you go. We don't want to people asking questions. And so the priest would kick them out and the Lord would lead them to salvation. So anyhow, um, to say, believe this because I'm telling you to believe it is no argument. And so anyhow, for the sake of an argument, let's assume that by some miracle, an infinite number of monkeys suddenly appear out of nowhere. So in order to make this thing work, now we're trying to help our evolutionist friends along a little here because an infinite number of monkeys, where they come from? Well, we don't know. All right, well, let's just assume, bang, by some miracle, there's an infinite number of monkeys. Which raises another question, actually, who chose the monkeys? Why not alligators? An infinite number of alligators. Why, why is that? Well, obviously, you already know the answer because the alligators wouldn't be able to, what? Type, right. And uh, the dog and the cat, as cute as they are, they can't seem to do, and so someone had to choose, and so the evolutionists chose the monkey. Um, now, that's uh, interesting because um, uh, did you know that according to Wikipedia, there are 260 known living species of monkeys in the world? Did you know that? It's not just one. There's 260. They range in size from four and a half inches to over three feet tall. So, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> which, which one of the species of monkeys gets to hammer away at the typewriter? An infinite number of monkeys, time out. What kind of monkey? Oh, well, what does it matter? Well, there's 260 uh, uh, different species. And uh, do you want four and a half inch m monkeys? Oh, no, no, why not? Because they can't type on the typewriter. Oh, so disqualify them, will you? And so we keep going down and disqualify, disqualify, disqualify till we get to basically the chimpanzee type of monkey. Oh, so that's what you want. So you chose that. That's not random choosing, by the way. If you have random choosing, you might end up with four and a half inch monkeys operating the typewriters. And that, that's not going to fly, is it? They could, they could have infinity of time and they still won't even get one page typed. It's just not going to happen. So there is some intelligent design in there, which violates... It actually violates Darwinian evolutionism. As soon as you introduce intellect, intellectual, intelligent design or choice, you violate Darwinian evolutionism. And so choosing the big monkeys is something like going to the alphabet and deliberately jumping over the first letters of the alphabet to get to the end of the alphabet. You made a deliberate choice to do that. And so right away, their own argument violates itself. But for sake of argument, let's just assume that the big monkeys are the only species of monkeys to suddenly appear out of nowhere. Can you see that we're going to have problems with this argument? Are you beginning to kind of get that impression? We're going to have some trouble with this. But let's move on. So now, we have all these monkeys. Where do we put them? Where do we put the monkeys? Are they all over the universe? Are they scattered everywhere all over the universe? Is that where they are? Don't you need some place for them to live? Do monkeys need a life-friendly environment in which to live? Like to breathe air? Do monkeys need to breathe air? So if you're going to have an infinite number of monkeys, you have to have some kind of world environment. <laughs> you have to now... See, we're trying to help out our evolutionist friends here. You need a world for them to live in, and if you need a world, where did the world come from? Our evolutionist friends say, well, an infinite number of monkeys. Hold on here. Where are they going to live? Where? They can't, they've got to live somewhere, right? Right. So where? And, well, okay, we're going to have a world for them. Well, will just any old world do? Can monkeys live in any climate? Could monkeys live on the North Pole? The answer is no. Monkeys need a tropical environment in which to live. And so if you're going to have a world with a tropical environment, you're going to need a sun. 
and you're going to need to somehow rotate that world to provide the even warmth and cooling necessary. So can you begin to see that we got problems with this argument? We're trying to help them out here a little bit. And uh, I suggest to you that um, <laughs> the world will not hold an infinite number of monkeys. Does that make sense? An infinite number of monkeys, where are you going to put them? There's, there's no, no planet. Even the, the largest planets of, that are known to mankind out there somewhere in deep, deep space, they're not big enough. So we got a problem. Where are you going to put these monkeys, this infinite monkey argument? I think it's much easier if you look at your Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 16. And it says here, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. He set, and God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And so there's your, your warming effect required by the sun. And uh, again, for sake of argument, let's assume that uh, this world-friendly environment suddenly appears out of nowhere to house these infinite number of monkeys. Okay, all right, let's move along. Okay, we got this infinite number of monkeys appearing out of nowhere. We've got a world-friendly environment appearing out of nowhere along with the sun and so on to keep it all proper. Do these infinite monkeys need to eat and drink in order to live? Because they said to us, an infinite number of monkeys with an infinite number of typewriters, well, how are these monkeys going to live if they've got nothing to eat because they need to eat in order and drink in order to live and so that means an infinite number of monkeys will require how much food an infinite right or am i wrong an infinite number of monkeys is going to require what an infinite amount of food that's right and where's all that food going to come from well i guess we got to go back to our perfect world environment what is it that monkeys eat do you know Fruits, bananas, someone said. What's that? Insects, mm -hmm. plants, leaves, things like that. So, where's all that going to come from? See, we're going to have to evolve all of that, right? But, you know, but for sake of argument, let's just assume that uh, all this bang suddenly came into being. Now, do these monkeys ever grow old and die? Uh, or do they live forever? How long does a monkey, a chimpanzee, live for? Do you know? Approximately. Not, not in captivity, where they're nicely pampered and fed, and they've got veterinarians to look after them, but out in the wilds. Do you know how long they live? It's about 30 years. About 30 years. That's how long a monkey lives. There are infinite number of monkeys. Are they going to live an infinite amount of time? Boy, you know, you're really stacking the deck. You can't have everything. You give us an infinite number of monkeys, an infinite number of typewriters, well, how long do the monkeys live for? The average monkey lives for about 30 years. Well, if they die, uh, what are you going to do with all the rotting bodies and corpses? Because you're going to have an infinite amount of rotting bodies. Now, how, how do you deal with that? How does God deal with that in nature? What God does is that he brings in animals who specialize in eating dead bodies. What are some of them? Vultures. Rats, eagles, you get the idea? Eagles, they eat dead things. Eagles are a member of the vulture family, and they eat dead things and blood and stuff like that. Oof. And so uh, along with that, now they'll eat most of it, but then the little bits that is left over, what does God do? He's got another whole army of workers. Those are the microorganisms. And those things get in there, and over time they just munch and eat, and the body is dissolved. That's what, that's what God has set up. But in order for you to have your infinite number of monkeys, and they're going to live 30 years each, and you're going to have all these rotting corpses, now we've got to suddenly have all of this infrastructure along with it. And so, for sake of argument, let's assume that out of nowhere came this world life-friendly environment that will house an infinite amount imagine that an infinite amount in a world and with all the food and all of the climate 
add all of the uh, mechanisms for looking after the dead bodies and so on. Boy, it, it, we're not even a third through. No, we're about a third. We're not halfway through yet. And already we've got problems with the infinite monkey idea. And I wonder... Well, let's move on anyhow. There's more questions that we could ask, but it's, it, it, we'll just move on here. So, um, by the way, if you're interested in any of these notes, please see Pastor Tim. He'll fix you up with some of these notes if you should miss something. Let's move on to question two, shall we? I said that there were two questions. The first question was what? Do you remember? Where the monkeys come from? You were dealing with the monkeys. Well, we're finished with the monkeys now. Guess what we're going to deal with? The typewriters. You give an infinite number of monkeys an infinite number of typewriters? Where do those typewriters come from? Where do they come from? Now, if the monkeys evolved, did the typewriters evolve? Now, those are serious questions that we must ask our evolutionist friend. He believes the monkey involved, evolved, but do evolutionists believe that typewriters evolved? Yes or no? No. Not even the hardest, hardest, hardest hearted, hardest headed evolutionist will believe that the wind can blow through a junkyard and magically assemble a Boeing 747 jet with its engines running and tanks full of fuel idling right there. No evolutionist, no one in their right mind believes that. It just doesn't happen. If you're wearing a watch, that thing didn't evolve, right? That thing had to be manufactured. Where did the typewriters come from? Our evolutionist friend says, I'll prove, I'll prove, I'll prove it to you. I'll prove that there's even a slimmer chance, a slim, slim chance, but I'll prove it to you. You give an infinite number of monkeys. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, we beat them to death on that. Okay. You give your monkeys an infinite number of typewriters. Time out here. Where did those typewriters come from? Because as far as we know, there has never, ever evolved a typewriter. Ever, ever. Typewriters are made deliberately by intelligent design. In making those typewriters, it requires uh, mass production. Now, we're not talking a typewriter for one monkey, or a hundred monkeys, or a million monkeys. How many typewriters are we talking about? Infinite. Now, we're not the ones that came up with this argument. If you're going to produce an infinite number of typewriters, what is required? What kind of infrastructure do you need in order to produce an infinite? They would have been better off with a million. But no, they had to choose an infinite number. All right, we'll play by their rules. What's required to produce an infinite number of typewriters? Well, I suggest to you that it requires the mass production of steel and rubber, which would require mining and the processing of iron ore and rubber plants. Typewriter parts must be carefully manufactured uh, to precise dimensions, which requires warehouses full of sophisticated machine tools. And all of these tools and all these processes must be operated by intelligent operators. So now we need to ask the question, who was the intelligent designer who designed the typewriter? And who were the intelligent operators who made all of the typewriters? Was it the monkeys? Was it the monkeys who did all of the mining operations? Was it the monkeys who smelted down the iron ore and who harvested the rubber from the rubber plants and mass manufactured all of the plants and operated all of the machinery necessary to produce the parts to build and assemble all these typewriters? Was it the monkeys who did it? Could they have done it? I don't think any evolutionist would believe that the monkeys did it. But if they did it, then that means the monkeys have superior intelligence. And in this case, it destroys the monkey argument because monkey, the monkey argument is based on random choices made by unintelligent monkeys, not intelligent choices made by smart monkeys. You will see soon, because I'll show you what's involved with Shakespeare's works, but a human, any average human with a typewriter could reproduce the complete works of William Shakespeare because they're intelligent and there's purpose. 
But when you come to unintelligent monkeys with random pecking and banging at the keyboard, you'll see that it doesn't work. Um, the infinite monkey argument, someone had to build the typewriters. And I believe that this is the death of a great argument because it implodes upon itself. There's more questions than just who made the typewriter. If I gave you a typewriter and said type, you'd say, um, I need paper. Wouldn't you? Who made the paper? If you're going to give a, a, a bunch of typewriters to a bunch of monkeys, you also have to give them paper. So, you know, you have to um, modify this thing. An infinite number of, of monkeys living in a world-friendly, life-friendly environment with all the sustaining um, uh, infrastructure required to sustain life for all of these monkeys uh, and all of the, uh, the uh, processing plants necessary to supply all of these typewriters. But the plants, I'm sorry, the, uh, the paper, you know, someone's got to cut down the trees. Someone's got to somehow churn all that up into pulp and process it into paper and cut it to the right size and bleach it too. You don't want black paper. So who's going to do that? But that's not all you need if you're going to type. What else do you need? Ribbons, yeah. Typewriters don't work without ribbons. And the ribbons are inked. Now some ribbons are nice. They got red and they got black. But let's just for argument's sake, give them black, okay? Who's going to invent the ribbon? Who's going to ink these ribbons? Who's going to wind the ribbons onto the spools? Monkeys can't even figure out how to change a ribbon, let alone how to manufacture one. So you see, the infinite monkey argument really has some imposing problems, doesn't it? Now, I know that it's theoretical, but hey, listen, it has to be based on some kind of logic Otherwise, it's no good. It's just like saying, believe it, because I'm telling you to believe it. You're telling me to believe in evolution, and you're giving me an argument based on logic? Well, let's logically look at your argument. You're telling me an infinite number of monkeys? Where did they come from? And where are we going to put them? How are they going to live? Right? It's, it's like two young people that say, well, we're going to get married. And the parents say, oh, and how are you going to live? Oh, we'll live on love. <laughs> Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they have an argument. A lot of young people come to their parents and say, hey, listen, two can live as cheaply as one. But in reality, two can live as cheaply as three. That's what really happens in reality. Yeah. The infinite monkey argument. What are we going to do with this thing? What really happens if you put a whole bunch of monkeys in a room with typewriters? What really happens? Number one, some of the monkeys will totally ignore the typewriters. Not interested whatsoever. Number two, some of the monkeys will bash at the keys for a while. Number three, some of the monkeys will play with the ribbons and others will pick fights with other monkeys because monkeys are scrappers. And monkeys fight and scream and hit and bite. That's what monkeys do. No monkey is going to sit for the next 30 years carefully typing the f complete works of William Shakespeare. Now, I want you to consider how big the complete works of William Shakespeare really is. According to a website called opensourceshakespeare.com, Shakespeare wrote 43 complete works consisting of 37 full-length plays plus poems and sonnets. Did you know that the plays alone, the 37 plays, contain 34,895 speeches made by 1,223 different people. And did you know that the 43 works of Shakespeare contain 884,420 words, which require almost 6 million carefully typed spaces and letters, and they must be in a perfect order. Is that possible for a monkey? Is it possible for any monkey? A statistician named William Biggs worked out the statistical odds of a monkey typing out the six million letters and spaces required to make up the 43 complete works of William Shakespeare. And he said that a monkey stands a one in 45 chance of hitting any one key correctly. 
just to hit one key, he stands a 1 in 45 chance. But you have to multiply that by the 6 million keystrokes required. Now, he's a mathematician. I am not. Mathematicians, when they talk about big numbers, they do it by the power of something. You've seen the number, and then up top, they put a little dash and a number. For example, 10 to the power of 2 would be 100, because you multiply the, the 10 by itself. 10 times 10 is 100. So 10 to the power of 2 would be 100. 10 to the power of 3 would be what? 1,000, because you multiply it by 10. Again, you add another zero. 10 to the power of 4 would be what? 10,000, right. Now, this statistician, William Biggs, came up with a number. He said that there is one chance in 10 to 12 million zeros. There's no name for that number. It is so big. One chance in 10 to 12 million zeros. So whatever that is, work it out at home on a computer, I don't know. But at this point, someone will still say, but pastor, there's always that one chance. Pastor, isn't there even the slightest possibility that if you really did give an infinite number of monkeys, an infinite number of type, uh, typewriters, then surely one of them, just by random, will eventually type the entire works of William Shakespeare. And I say, absolutely, you're right. You're absolutely correct. Only thing is you have to include God into the equation. If God is not included, it won't happen. You see, you're going to need God to create the monkeys. You're going to need God to create a world for them to live in and to create the necessary food for them to eat. You're going to need God to build the typewriters and make the paper and the ink that every typewriter requires. You're going to need God to keep the monkeys focused on their typewriter and not on killing each other. You're going to need God to change the paper and the ink so that the monkeys can just keep on typing. And you're going to need God to unjam the typewriter keys when they get stuck so the monkeys can keep on typing out William Shakespeare. So, yeah, it's possible, but you're going to need God to make it happen. Now, in the monkey argument, in the monkey argument, there's one thing the evolutionists don't want to talk about, and that's the time factor. And they say, given enough time, but how long do monkeys live for? About 30 years. Some less, some more, but about 30 years. It is impossible for any monkey in order in only 30 years to randomly hit enough typewriter keys in perfect order and to keep changing the paper and keep changing the ribbons so as to produce the 1,800 pages of 8.5 by 11 inch paper to complete the whole works of Shakespeare. The Darwinian evolutionists talk of an infinite number of monkeys and an infinite number of typewriters, but they do not say an infinite amount of time. And the reason is because most Darwinian scientists believe that our universe is 14 billion years old. It never used to be that old. If you went back to the 30s, it was millions of years old. But now apparently it's billions of years old and it's to accommodate their theory. But most Darwinian scientists would say the universe is 14 billion years old and um, the people who work with the odds of probability, there's a US pro uh, computer programmer by the name of Jesse Anderson. He says that he worked this out. 14 billion years is not enough time for the monkeys to type out the complete works of Shakespeare. Even an infinite number of monkeys with an infinite number of typewriters. But remember, the monkeys can only live 30 years. And even if they could live much, much longer, it's not enough time, according to men who work out the probabilities. And so one expert gave us the actual odds of such a thing happening as being one chance in 10 to the 12 millionth power. Another expert told us that 14 billion years is a drop in the ocean compared to the time it would require 
for this thing to happen. Sadly, the truth, the bottom line is that the infinite number of monkey argument only raises an infinite number of embarrassing questions. And it's a whole lot easier to believe these words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It makes a whole lot more sense to believe in a divine, intelligent creator who created everything that we have and enjoy in this world. It's so much easier and so much more logical to believe in that than to believe an infinite a number of monkeys with their infinite number of typewriters. The bottom line, folks, is that we have an intelligently designed world and God is the designer and not only, but the sustainer of life as well. Now, did you know that Jesus himself came up with a twist on the infinite monkey argument? I'd like you to look at it in Matthew chapter 19, if you would go there now. Matthew chapter 19. The French mathematician in 1913 who originally came up with the idea of a million monkeys with a million typewriters, what that man was saying was correct. That a million monkeys with a million typewriters can't come up with, cannot produce, cannot produce all the equivalent of all of the world's richest libraries. It's impossible. That's what he was saying. The Lord, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 24, <clears throat> I'd like you to read these words out loud together with me now, would you please? And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And what Jesus was saying was, if you take a needle, the little hole is called the eye. Try and put a camel through that. Well, it can't be done, you say. That's what Jesus is saying. I know that there are some people who say, Oh, Pastor, don't you know that the eye of the needle referred to a very small little gate in the walls of Jerusalem where a camel could get through, but he had to get down on his knees, his hands and knees, and just to crawl through. My friend, don't you know that that gate was not invented to about three or four hundred years after Jesus? It was not around in Jesus' day. The eye of the needle gate. It wasn't there when Jesus was giving this. And so what does that leave us with? An ordinary needle that had an ordinary hole in it. Now maybe you've got some needles at home. And maybe some of your needles have a, a hole opening that's maybe 1 64th of an inch. I don't know what that would be in millimeters. I'm not sure yet. I'm still a little old school. But maybe you've got one that's half that size or twice that size. Who cares? You'll still never get a camel through it. Try and put your family automobile through it. It's not going to happen. It's an impossibility. This was Jesus' way of expressing it. And what Jesus was saying, using this analogy, is that <coughs> it's impossible to get to heaven any other way than through him. Because remember what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That means that all of a man's good works are no good. A man does good works all his life and comes to the end and dies and expects something, something good. He's in for a sad disappointment because all his good works, all of his reading of the Bible... And listen, I'm all for good works and I'm all for reading the Bible. All of his church attendance, I'm all for church attendance. All of his giving of tithes or offerings, I'm all for giving offerings. Even getting baptized, it doesn't do it. It's like trying to put the family automobile through the eye of the needle. It is impossible for any of those things to get anyone to heaven. You may be here today and you may be the nicest person in Surrey. We all take a vote and we come up with your name. You are the nicest person that we know. And you're good to your family and you're nice to work with. But none of that is going to account for anything when it comes to getting to heaven. It cannot. It's impossible. It's like trying to sit on your toaster and ride it to work. Your toaster is meant to toast bread. It's not meant to transport you to work. Your car can transport you to work or the, the 
SkyTrain when it's working, but not your toaster. Your good works cannot get you to heaven. No matter what kind of good work it is, it won't work. You may as well try to put a camel through the eye of a needle. You must come through Jesus Christ or you don't come at all. Jesus taught us there's a heaven above and there's a hell below. That's what Jesus taught us. And so if evolution really is false, then creation really is true. And that means that you and I must answer one day to our creator. My Christian friend, let me ask you this silly question. Is there a monkey on your back? We've been talking about monkeys today. Might there be a monkey on your back? You say, well, what kind of monkey? I'm saying the monkey of worldly ways. That's a pretty miserable monkey. The monkey of worldly ways. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? There are so many Christians who, you know, after they get saved, they're saved now. They're, the way they live their life is according to the way the world lives its life. And that may as well be a monkey in your life. You say, what do you mean? I mean this. So many Christians say, if I can just get enough good grades in school, then I'll get that dream job. They say, if only I can work hard enough, then I'll get ahead. The world says that if you throw enough spaghetti at the wall, something's got to stick. That's what the world says. And so us Christians, we buy into that and we say, if I can just make enough money, then I'll be fine. If I can just buy enough lotto tickets, then I can win big. Then I can retire. Or if I can just dress sexy enough, then I'll get someone to marry. How silly we are living our Christian lives according to the world and not according to simple faith in our Heavenly Father. Jesus said these words. You'll know them when I read them. Listen. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, but your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now that's, if you're here and you're part of God's family, that's God's message for you. You know, we laugh at those evolutionists for their worldly ways, but I'm telling you right now, they're laughing right back at us because they see us living more for the world than for Jesus Christ. That's the truth. What are we going to do about it? Why don't we make a decision today? Can I invite you to make a decision today in your heart? Can I invite you to come on your invitation? Maybe it's been a long time since you've come on an invitation and you make a decision or listen to this, reaffirm your decision that you're going to live whatever amount of time you have left on earth, be it months or years, you're going to live for the Lord. You're not going to make the same mistakes tomorrow that you've made yesterday. You're going to start doing it God's way, not the world's way. It doesn't matter what some of the professionals are trying to tell you. Do it God's way. Always put God first. Can I invite you to come on our invitation and throw a monkey off your back today? And I want you to bring your struggles and your worries and the things you're scared about and the things you're guilty about and all those things that are pulling you to pieces. And I want you to cast them on the altar today. Cast them on the Lord. It says, casting all your cares upon him for he careth for you. And start walking every day with Jesus Christ. What a wonderful, wonderful thought to start life afresh. A brand new start. That could be yours now. Let's stand to our feet, shall we? I encourage you, I invite you to stand to your feet. We've been talking about evolution today and the, the silliness of that argument. But I'll tell you what, there's a whole lot more silliness in a Christian living according to the world rather than according to God's will. Isn't there?